Hello, thank you for joining with me. We are in chapter 27 of A Course in Miracles, reading with the Course Companions out of a, the complete and annotated edition of A Course in Miracles, edited by Robert Perry. We are in section, tw section 2 of chapter 27, Healing the Ancient Dream, and this is Proof of Innocence. If you would please like to close your eyes and join me in prayer. Dear Father, if left to my own devices, my perception will be skewed. I surrender to you everything that I think and feel. God, please take my past, plan my future, send your spirit to redeem my mind that I might be set free. May I be your channel, God, and serve the world. May I become who you would have me be, do what you would have me do, go where you would have me go, and say what you would have me say, and to whom, dear God. God, please allow me to set aside everything I think I know for an open mind and a new experience. And so it is. Amen. Proof of Innocence Is healing frightening? To many, yes. For accusation is a bar to love, and damaged bodies are accusers. We're going to go down immediately to footnote 9. In other words, healing is frightening to many because they want a damaged body that silently accuses their brothers of guilt. Back to the text. They stand firmly in the way of trust and peace, proclaiming that the frail can have no trust and that the damaged have no grounds for peace. Who has been injured by his brother and could love and trust him still? He has attacked, <coughs> excuse me, and will attack again. Protect him not because your damaged body shows that you must be protected from him. To forgive may be an act of charity, but not his due. He may be pitied for his guilt, but not exonerated. And if you forgive him his transgressions, you but add to all the guilt that he has really earned. The unhealed cannot pardon, for they are the witnesses that pardon is unfair. For they are the witnesses that pardon is unfair. They would retain the consequences of the guilt they overlook. Yet no one can forgive a sin which he believes is real. And what has consequences must be real because what it has done is there to see. Forgiveness is not pity, which but seeks to pardon what it knows to be the truth. Good cannot be returned for evil. And we're going to go down to footnote 10. This is a reinterpretation of the common idea that we should return good for evil, an idea based on Bible verses such as 1 Peter 3, 9. Do not return evil for evil or reveling for reveling, but on the contrary, bless. And Romans 12, 17, 21. Repay no one evil for evil. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. The Course does want us to respond to apparent evil with blessing, goodness, and forgiveness. Jesus' point here, though, is that seeing another's act as truly evil precludes real forgiveness, fostering instead, instead a subtle one-upmanship in which your forgiveness of his evil is proof of your moral superiority. And back to the text... All right, so I'm going to repeat that line. Good cannot be returned for evil. For forgiveness does not first establish sin and then forgive it. Who can say and mean, my brother, you have injured me, and yet because I am the better of the two, I pardon you my hurt. His pardon and your hurt cannot exist together. One denies the other and must make it false. To witness sin and yet forgive Forgive it is a paradox which reason cannot see. For it, and we're going to go down to footnote 11, it refers to witnessing sin. So witnessing sin maintains what has been done to you deserves no pardon, and by giving it you grant your brother mercy, but retain the proof he is not really innocent. The sick remain uh, accusers, excuse me, the sick remain accusers. They cannot forgive their brothers and themselves as well. For no one in whom forgiveness reigns can suffer. He holds not the proof of sin before his brother's eyes, and thus he must have overlooked it 
and removed it from his own. Footnote 12, Matthew 7, 3, 5. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is a log in your own eye? You hypocrite! First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. In the Course's illusion, the log to be removed from your own eye is the speck of sin that you see in your brother's eye. Forgiveness cannot be for one and not the other. Who forgives is healed, and in his healing lies proof that he is truly pardoned and retains no trace of condemna condemnation that he still would hold against himself or any living thing. Forgiveness is not real unless it brings a healing to your brother and yourself. You must attest his sins had no effect on you to demonstrate they were not real. How else could he be guiltless? And how could his innocence be justified unless his sins have no effects to warrant guilt? Sins are beyond forgiveness just because they would entail effects which cannot be undone and overlooked entirely. In their undoing lies the proof that they were merely errors. Let yourself be healed that you may be forgiving, offering salvation to your brother and yourself. A broken body shows the mind has not been healed. A miracle of healing proves that separation is without effect. What you would prove to him you will believe. The power of witness comes from your belief and everything you say or do or think, but testifies to what you teach to him. Your body can be means to teach that it has never suffered pain because of him. And in its healing can it offer him mute testimony to his innocence. It is this testimony that can speak with power greater than a thousand tongues, for here is his forgiveness proved to him. A miracle can offer nothing less to him than it has given unto you. So does your healing show your mind is healed and has forgiven what he did not do. And so is he convinced his innocence was never lost and healed along with you. Thus does the, miracle, does the miracle undo all things the world attests can never be undone. And hopelessness and death must disappear before the ancient clarion call of life. This call has power far beyond the weak and miserable cry of death and guilt. The ancient calling of the father to his son and of the son unto his own will yet be the last trumpet that the world will ever hear. And we're going to read footnote 13. And it's 1 Corinthians 15. Lo, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. Brother, back to the text, brother there is no death, footnote 14, Proverbs 28, 12, 28. In the way of righteousness is life and in the pathway thereof there is no death. Back to the text. And this you learn when you but wish to show your brother that you had no hurt of him. He thinks your blood is on his hands, and so he stands condemned. But it is given you to show him by your healing that his guilt is but the fabric of a senseless dream. How just are miracles, for they bestow an equal gift of full deliverance from guilt upon your brother and yourself. Your healing saves him pain as well as you, and you are healed because you wished him well. This is the law the miracle obeys, that healing sees no specialness at all. It does not come from pity, but from love, and love would prove all suffering is but a vain imagining, a foolish wish 
with no effects. Your health is the result of your desire to see your brother with no blood upon his hands, nor guilt upon his heart made heavy with the proof of sin. And what you wish is given you to see. The cost of your serenity is his. This is the price the Holy Spirit and the world interpret differently. Footnote 15. In other words, as the following sentences explain, the world believes that your serenity depends on the sacrifice of your brothers. In contrast, the Holy Spirit knows that your serenity depends on the presence of His. Back to the text. The world perceives in it a statement of the fact that your salvation sacrifices His. The Holy Spirit knows your healing is the witness unto His and cannot be apart from Him at all. As long as He consents to suffer, you will be unhealed. But you can show to Him His suffering is purposeless and holy without cause. Show Him your healing, and He will consent no more to suffer, for His innocence has been established in your sight and His. And laughter will replace your sighs, because God's Son remembered that He is God's Son. Who then feels, fears healing? Only those to whom their brother's sacrifice and pain is seen to represent their own serenity. Their helplessness and weakness represent the grounds on which they justify His pain. The constant sting of guilt he suffers serves to prove that he is slave and they are free. The constant pain they suffer demonstrates that they are free because they hold him bound. And sickness is desired to prevent a shift of balance in the sacrifice. We'll go down to footnote 16. This means they want to keep their sickness because they are happy with the current balance of sacrifice. Their sacrifice, being sick, requires their brother to sacrifice by feeling guilty. Their sickness costs them, but it seems worth it if they can thereby purchase what they really want, their brother's guilt. If, however, they are healed, then their brother is off the hook. They have lost what they valued, which was his guilt, while he has been set free. Now there is no balance at all in the sacrifice. They have sacrificed his guilt, and he has sacrificed nothing. Back to the text. How could the Holy Spirit be deterred an instant, even less, to reason with an argument for sickness such as this? And need your healing be delayed because you pause to listen to insanity? And now we will read Robert Perry's commentary on this section, Proof of Innocence. This section takes aim at, the, at a core dynamic in forgiveness as well as in our health that we didn't even know was there. The dynamic is this. We want to forgive our brother while, we sti while still retaining within ourselves the proof that he sinned. That proof is our woundedness. This takes the form of emotional injury, but the big focus in this section is physical injury. As Jesus explained in the previous section, we manifest sickness in our body as the physical proof of what our brother has done to us. We therefore have conflicting motivation and send conflicting messages. On one hand, we want to retain our woundedness, both physical and emotional, in order to hold the proof of guilt before our brother's eyes. On the other hand, we want to forgive him. It simply doesn't occur to us that these two things don't go together, yet they clearly don't. They are a paradox which reason cannot see. This means that as long as we harbor that proof of guilt within our body and emotions, our forgiveness will be severely constrained. It will not be true, wholehearted forgiveness. Rather, it will be pity. You poor sinner, I feel really sorry for you and wish that you could do better or wish that you could feel better. And it will be condensation. 
My brother, you have injured me, and yet because I am the better of the two, I pardon you my hurt. Do either of those sound like real forgiveness? If we want to forgive, then we face a big question. Are we willing to be healed of all our woundedness? Or do we want to retain our wounds for the sake of the condemning message they send? As I said above, we generally don't even realize this is a question. Yet, now that we are faced with it, my guess is that somewhere inside of us, we feel a deep rumbling of relevance. Somewhere inside, we know this is a genuine issue. This, in fact, is why we have been afraid of healing. Notice how Jesus both begins and ends the section on this theme. The first paragraph begins with the question, Is healing frightening? And the last paragraph begins with the question, Who then fears healing? We have feared healing because we wanted to keep holding up that picture of crucifixion before our brother's eyes. As you can readily see in this section, Jesus believes that this is directly relevant to our health. If we want real health, we need to wish no longer to use our body to send messages of guilt. Who knew that this was even an issue? Yet there is no mistaking that Jesus is saying it I'm sorry yet there is no mistaking that Jesus is saying it is your health is the result of your desire to see your brother with no blood upon his hands nor guilt upon his heart made heavy with the proof of sin really my health is the result of that part of my reaction to this section is that Jesus is identifying I don't <laughs> A dynamic that is so deep and so unspoken, I mean, who talks about this, that it's difficult to get in touch with, let alone take action to ameliorate. ameliorate. So what can we do about it? I think the first thing is to just get in touch with this dynamic in ourselves to whatever extent that we can. For instance, if I picture myself being completely healed inside and out so that I do send the message to others that they never hurt me, I can feel something in me catch on that and say, but then how will they ever get the message? The message, obviously, is the message of how they've done me wrong. The dynamic Jesus is describing then is definitely in me. I think the second thing that we can do is actively accept healing into ourselves for the sake of sending a message of forgiveness to our brothers. Look at this passage. Your body can be means to teach that it has never suffered pain because of him. And in its healing can it offer him mute testimony to his innocence. It is this testimony that can speak with power greater than a thousand tongues. For here is his forgiveness proved to him. Wouldn't it be wonderful to accept our healing and thereby offer our brother that mute testimony to his innocence? To want to be healed so that we can be the visible proof that our brother's sins have never really happened is a beautiful thing. It makes the statement to ourselves and our brother that we really mean it, that our forgiveness is absolutely genuine. As much as we possibly can, then, we need to unite our feeling and our will with this line. Let yourself be healed that you may be forgiving, offering salvation to your brother and yourself. Thank you so much for joining with me. This is Robert Perry's commentary of section 2 of chapter 27, Healing the Ancient Dream, Dream and this is Proof of Innocence, day 313 with the Course Companions group. Thank you so much. I love you. Have a beautiful day.